Hello, and welcome back once again to the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast. This is episode 55. John and Wendy talk to Brad Galen. I'm your host, John. And I'm Wendy. How's it going tonight, John? I'm doing well. I feel like I haven't been able to talk to you in a while. Work travel has been absolutely nuts. Yes, you have been crazy busy. Oh, you're all over the place. Uh, (laughs) Can't keep track of what time zone you're in. (laughs) I I can't either. I can't either. (laughs) It's it's interesting we're recording tonight. This is the one-year anniversary of the launch of episode zero. And wanted to talk just very briefly because in the last year we've been offered a lot of other opportunities and some great things have come from the podcast. I had a really interesting one come up that that just got released in the last few weeks. Some of you may be familiar with XREF, uh, a company out of Australia, does a lot with reference checks and things. I'm taking part in their HR hub, and it's a, a new platform that they've put in on their website where they have content from practitioners and, and other analysts and vendors talking about all types of topics, AI, recruiting, leadership. It's pretty cool stuff. And I'm actually the, I open the, vi- I have the opening video there. So hoping people will check it out. Uh, they're going to be adding content throughout the year. If it's something that maybe one of the listeners would be interested in participating in, they're always looking for new contributors. And I'll tell you, if you haven't done a lot of video, it's a, it's a very different thing. <laughs> I have to say it was <laughs> nerve wracking that first time to do it, but a lot of fun and look forward once I am settled again to be able to con- contribute to some more content to XREF down the road. That's awesome. You know, uh, it just goes to show never say never. As as the person always said, we're not doing video. Um, (laughs) You're, you're, you're breaking us in, John. That's awesome. Well, like I said, Wendy, uh, a lot of fun and got some things, you know, kind of planned for maybe later in the year when we're together, looking forward to that, but got a great guest tonight, excited to have him with us and I'll let you make the introduction. We'll get started. Wonderful. So excited to welcome Brad to the show tonight. Spending much of his early life working in theme parks, first as a ride operator and later in public relations at Kings Island outside Cincinnati, Brad has many unique and fun experiences since graduating from Indiana University. His HR experience began in policy development and training for international theme park services. This role took him around the world to train staff, including extended assignments, to open new parks in China, Mexico, and Brazil. Following that, Brad was hired as the first HR professional for a family-owned printing company and established their HR practices from scratch before taking on the challenge as the Director of HR and Corporate Compliance for Stonebelt, a nonprofit social service organization with over 500 employees in Bloomington, Indiana. After completing his MBA, Brad serves as the Director of Human Resources for the 1,200 employees and 8,900 students of the Port Ridge public schools in Southwest Michigan, and has his own side gig as the president and principal consultant with Allegro HR. Staying involved with the larger HR community is important, and Brad served for 10 years on the Indiana State Council of SHRM, was a member of the SHRM social media team, and has volunteered time for many other local organizations. But most importantly, Brad is kept well-grounded at home by his wife, Suzanne, and their two kids, Jack and Annie. Brad, welcome to the show tonight. We are super excited to have you on the show. And our first question is always, what's in your glass? Well, actually, tonight I have a 13-year-old Craig Lachey scotch in my glass, and it was a Christmas present from my brother and sister-in-law, and it is a delightful, nice scotch. So I'm enjoying it (laughs) quite quite a bit, actually. And hopefully I won't enjoy it too much as the podcast goes on. (laughs) I think that may be the fanciest beverage anybody has had on the show so far. Hey, you know, if you had told me even like seven, eight years ago that I'd be a scotch drinker, I would have said, no way, can't stand the stuff. But (laughs) I've become quite a fan, and so that's the way it is. And I just, I'll raise my glass to you guys. I mean, here we are recording under one year anniversary for launching the podcast. So just congratulations. It's a great milestone. And 50 plus episodes in and you guys are going strong. So uh, congratulations. Thank you. We appreciate that. Brad, I know we got to spend some time together last year in Chicago and scarily have a lot of similar interest and background. Didn't really talk though much about how exactly did you get your start in HR? Well, I'm one of those accidental people into HR, as, as many of us, I think, are. 
my HR career really uh, tied to my theme park experience. So um, I graduated from Indiana University, and my degree is actually in biology and environmental studies. And I was told at that time that the environmental field, which is really was my interest at the time, was six months away from really opening up and bringing lots of jobs. And I'm pretty sure they're still telling students that to this day. Um, but I, I kind of pivoted from my summer employment, where I had worked at Kings Island near Cincinnati and had been in ride operations, and pivoted that into a real full-time job working as a theme park consultant with a Cincinnati-based company called International Theme Park Services. And I was hired, along with um, someone else who worked at Kings Island, to write and develop policies and procedures for a chain of theme parks in China. So that's how I kind of entered the world of HR. So policy procedure development uh, that took us to China to do uh, training and, and grand opening preparation for the, the parks there and did kind of similar things for other client parks. So that's how I got into the uh, wonderful world of HR. That's awesome. I, I don't, I, you're the first one that we've had that can literally say they did HR with roller coasters. Um. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So obviously, um, from the bio, you made the move from the private sector to the public sector. What was the draw for you to make that move? And what challenges are you facing when it comes to working in public schools to how, uh, how do they compare with what you've dealt with previously? Well, well, the move was really predicated on our move to Michigan. So we moved from Bloomington, Indiana. We moved five hours north here to Portage, Michigan. Um, that was actually done for my wife's job. Uh, she works in the medical device industry and got a new job up here. She got the proverbial offer you can't refuse. So we came up here, and my original plan was actually just to go into consulting full time. But at the time up here, the, the Portage Public Schools, which is the district we actually live in, uh, they were going through some, some pretty rough times, some controversy involving their previous HR director and a previous superintendent and an inappropriate relationship there. I applied just on a whim for the job here in Portage and got it, clicked right away with, with the superintendent who was hired a month before I was hired. It's been a fabulous journey in the five and a half years now that I've been there. And really, the, the public sector... While it certainly has some different challenges, from an HR perspective, people are people, and you're going to encounter many of the same things. And it's, it's funny, I have that conversation with some of our administrators, some of our principals and folks who have only been in public education and maybe only have spouses in public education. They're like, this, the weird stuff that happens here doesn't happen in, in other places, does it? I said, oh, yeah, it, it does. It, it, it's much the same. I think the biggest learning curve <laughs> for me was the biggest learning curve for me was the um, dealing with the um, collective bargaining. I had never been in a unionized environment before. Uh, the district, when I started, had four labor unions with, or I'm sorry, five labor unions. We're down to four now. One of the labor unions has decertified since I've been there, and oh, wow. that was that took some getting that that took some getting used to of just going through the collective bargaining process and serving as the district's uh, chief negotiator for every bargaining unit except our largest one, the teachers, where we have our legal counsel with us at the table. That's That's been the biggest thing, but people are people everywhere, and they bring the good, the bad, and the ugly with them. Yes, they do. <laughs> Brad, being in the public schools, recognizing that obviously there's a lot of challenges in education right now, and it, like you said, people are certainly people. Are there particular things you see that, like, I guess, you know, personnel or is it is it hard to find people not even let's say the teachers but bus drivers things like that i mean i know where i live they've they've had so many issues finding support staff it's frightening like there just aren't people period you know much less people interested in the job they just can't get anybody at all is there are you seeing similar issues like that where you are yes we are and it, and it's certainly much more with the support staff than with the teachers so we're very fortunate in my district our, we, we're kind of a destination district where people want to be teachers. We have a good, our pay scale is higher than some of the surrounding districts. Uh, we have really supportive parents and supportive programs and new facilities. So my teacher hiring actually goes a lot smoother than like the things you alluded to. Bus drivers are a challenge. Uh, support staff for our daycare program. We operate a, a daycare program as well. 
uh, those are folks making minimum wage. And yeah, it's a hard thing. Or food service staff, when they can go down the road and get more hours and probably higher pay at McDonald's. That support staff issue is, is an issue, I think, in public schools everywhere. And unlike the private sector, I can't just raise my prices to try to compensate folks more in a lot of our areas. So we, have, we get a foundation allowance from the state of Michigan. That pretty much is the majority of our revenue there, along with federal and state grant dollars. Again, can't really control those. So we really do have to manage our budget very carefully and really make sure we're putting the resources in where they can maximize the impact on the kids. And that that's really, I'm blessed because all of us on our executive leadership team we think about that all the time. What is best for kids and how can we get it there? That's great to hear. Talking beyond the day job, we you know, we mentioned briefly too that you have the side business with Allegro. Talk a little bit about the clients that you have there. Do you see comparable issues, not only, I guess, between them, but also with the school system or what does that look like? A lot of, yeah, a lot of those same issues. Um, some of the clients I deal with tend to be on the, on the smaller business side, so they don't have really an existing HR person or someone knowledgeable about HR things. So a lot of that becomes a compliance issue. Do I have to do this? I, I heard about this new law. What does it mean for us? Um, in Michigan, for example, we, we had two voter-passed initiatives, uh, one raising the minimum wage and then another one um, guaranteeing paid sick time. And the paid sick time one has been a, a trickier one for folks because there's a lot of nitty gritty details in it. So that's one of the things that's tripping a lot of people up as it prepares to come into effect, it goes into effect um, in March. So there's a lot of work around that. But I think in terms of similarities, yeah, finding kind of some of those lower level, more entry level positions and keeping them filled and trying to reduce turnover on that, that's universal almost across the board, whether it's a dealing with a restaurant and microbrewery or a small distributing company, anything like that. That's where the challenges lie, less so on the skilled side and more so just in kind of that everyday unskilled labor who can easily go to the next job, especially when you have unemployment that's under 4%. I think that's a, a challenge everyone's kind of facing. <laughs> yeah. I would say it's nice to know we're all in the same boat sometimes. Right. Yeah. If we didn't laugh, we'd cry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, yeah, that's the benefit of having a good HR community. We we know each other's pain, and we can we can commiserate and try to share ideas and and hope that we can all find a solution. But at this point, you know, it's it's just a matter of matching up your your needs with what you're able to do. Um, and it, when you have an un low unemployment like this, you're going to have that. I mean, someday it will swing the other way. That'll bring a whole different set of challenges, and you just have to embrace those as they come as well. Switching gears a little bit, you have a blog titled Roller Coaster HR, which I'm sure is both literal and figurative. <laughs> so what's been, um, what's been the best thing that's come out of your blog, and also need to know what your favorite roller coaster is? Uh, that's a tough question, actually. You know, that I, I, the tagline on my blog is HR is like a roller coaster. It has ups, it has downs, and sometimes it will make you sick. <laughs> and Amen. That, that's true. Yes. Um, but one of the things that I, I've enjoyed about the blog, one of the things that gets brought out, has just been a venue for me to share ideas and to write kind of what I'm thinking. And Originally, I started the blog, and I thought the focus would be all HR all the time, but it's been going now, I think, four, maybe five years. I've had it going for quite a while, and I don't write as regularly as I would like to, and I think there are many bloggers who could say that as well. Um, but the thing I enjoy is it's just given me an avenue, and, and, and times forces me to be able to verbalize something that maybe I'm feeling or I need to get out. And it forces me to share it out there. So when I write a blog post and I know I'm going to publish it, I'm pretty careful about what I say and how I say it. So it helps me refine ideas sometimes. And I think a lot of bloggers most likely have a stack of blogs, of blog posts that have not necessarily been published, but that you work on. And I mean, I have a few of those and one I'm actually tweaking right now, but I'm probably going to publish in the next week or two. But I've actually had sitting, I've been sitting on for about six months now because I feel like I'm finally at a point where I can 
write down or verbalize what it is I'm feeling and what I want to say so I can get that out there. And I think that's been the biggest benefit from it. I think the other thing it's done over time is really selfishly has raised my profile within the HR community. It was after I launched my blog that I became part of the Sturm social media team and get to meet wonderful folks like you guys through that. And I think that to me is one of the most valuable things that's come out of it. You've avoided the roller coaster question. <laughs> oh yeah, that's the tough one. There's so many good ones, but you know, my default one's probably going to be back at my home park at Kings Island is uh, is the Beast, which is wooden roller coaster. It opened in 1979. To this day, it is still the longest wooden roller coaster in the world at over 7,000 feet. It's about a five minute long okay. ride. Um, and the best part is when I worked at Kings Island. There's a section of the coaster kind of at, it's after the first drop and you've gone through the tunnel and you've kind of made the first left hand curve around and you make a right hand curve around and it's a shed it's a covered area it's called the brake shed and, they, and there's brakes there that slow down the coaster most of the time but there were times when we were running it <laughs> just for employees that, <laughs> most well and I say that because there were times when we'd run it if we're like an employee only event we'd open it just for employees and stuff we'd turn what are called the trim brakes which are what slow coasters down and stretches like that, and most coasters have them somewhere, but they turn them off. And so you just go flying through there, and you're carrying more speed going into the next tunnel and the next section that by the time you hit the second lift hill on the coaster, you ended up about halfway up before the lift chain really took over. So, um, yeah, the Beast is probably wow. still my favorite, although there's so many good coasters. I love the ones at Cedar Point, Millennium Force, as a steel coaster is fa fabulous. And there's a small park in southern Indiana called Holiday World. They have three of the best wooden coasters in the world. And there's this tiny little park. It's in Santa Claus, Indiana. But they, they have the Raven there and then the Voyage, which might be my next favorite one as well. Oh, wow. Brad, you're bringing up all kinds of memories. I think we talked about the fact I grew up in Louisville, certainly. Knew, I knew Santa Claus land, <laughs> mm -hmm. spent a lot yeah. of time at Kings Island, and then I was actually a ride operator at Opryland. I don't know if we talked about that before. Yeah, I think I did know I that. Ran, so, yeah, yeah, I, I ran ran the Screaming Delta Demon and the That's log flumes and the cable. You got more money for running the cable cars because it was the most physical job in the park. <laughs> so I got paid 30 cents more than everybody else for running the wow, cable cars. Good. Go figure. Well, yeah, well, the, <laughs> good times. Yeah, the oh, former, yeah, the, the the former COO of Opryland, Willie Garza. I've, I've known Willie a long time, and he had some good stories from his Opryland days. So, <laughs> oh, and now it's man. a mall. <laughs> yeah, it's sad. Brad, it is now time for everyone's favorite part of our show: the half-hour question connection. Our first question, and these are all brand new questions um, for the new year. We got new questions, so. First question, who was your first professional mentor, and what was the most important or impactful thing you learned from them? First professional mentor had uh, from the HR side, and actually I didn't know him from the HR side at first, um, was actually my next door neighbor when I was growing up in Cincinnati, and originally he was a park police officer at Kings Island, and uh, he's the one who helped kind of get me in the door into ride operations, because when I first applied at Kings Island, they offered me food service or games, and that's not what I wanted to do. And so I think he pulled a few strings and got me a placement in ride operation. Um, the rest is history there. But eventually he moved out of the park police and moved into HR and eventually became uh, the vice president of HR at Canada's Wonderland, which is a sister park to Kings Island, and then down in Charlotte at Carowinds. He was the VP of HR there as well um, before moving to uh, Coca-Cola, where he became a regional VP of HR. So uh, Dave Greenberg, I, I would say, would be my first professional mentor. And the biggest piece of advice that he told me, and it has stuck with me, and I think about it frequently, um, has to do with when you're parting ways with people. So when, when you have, have to let someone go or fire them for whatever reason, he, his, his line to me was, if you ever st start to enjoy firing people, that's your sign that you need to stop doing it. And I've never gotten to the point where I enjoy it. I hate it to this day. Thankfully, it's not something I have to do very often. Uh, but that's the, that's the piece of advice that definitely sticks with me that came from Dave. Truer words have never been said. I'm with you. Yeah. 
Brad, who's one person you've gained in your network in the last year or so that you think more people should know? Doesn't have to be an HR person, but just somebody that you have gotten to connect with that you really think we all should know about. You know, the introvert in me hasn't met many people in the last year. I got to think about that. I think one person who jumps to mind and someone I've enjoyed getting to know a little bit more through my work at Sherm, with Sherm Foundation um, is a Louisville-based executive coach and HR guy, Jeff Nally. I've really enjoyed all of my chats with him. He is gregarious and outgoing and really seems to enjoy life to its fullest. So I'm jealous of that sometimes. Um, but he's somebody that if you haven't had a chance to uh, follow his stuff on, on either Twitter or Facebook. Um, Jeff, Jeff Nally definitely is somebody uh, worth connecting with, and he's usually at different events and things like that and easy to find and really easy to talk to. So I would say I'd put Jeff on that, that list. So, Brad, if you could go back to the start of your career, what's one piece of advice you would give yourself based on what you know now? Well, it depends when you define career starting. I look back at my actually my college career and wondered why did I major in biology and environmental studies. And my original major, actually, my freshman year, I spent at the University of North Carolina Wilmington, and I was studying marine biology, and was talked out of the major by one of my professors who said there's no future in it. And then the ironic thing is, I ended up working at a public aquarium as the director of operations. I, I don't know whether that was true advice or bad advice. I don't know, but I think. I probably would get, take more, would have taken more advice and more business type of classes than I did as an undergrad. Um, my one of my favorite classes as an undergrad was a business law class that I took, and that should have been a sign to me to focus more on that. And it took me many years before I would, felt I was ready to pursue a master's program. And it was that business advice that I decided, okay, I'm going to get my MBA and really focused that way. Even though I'm in HR, my MBA specialization is an organization and leadership development. So it fits really nicely with, with my HR work. But yeah, the advice is do more business stuff early on and probably less of the science. Um, plus my GPA probably would have been better if I had less science classes. <laughs> Brad, how do you enjoy giving back to the HR community? One of the things that I, I do support pretty strongly is the Sherm Foundation. Through, through donations and stuff, that's actually connected to my MBA because I I'm the, I'm the lucky recipient of a Sherm Foundation scholarship, and that was my sign when I applied for the scholarship. I said if I get it, that means I need it's time for to go back to school. If I don't, then it's not. Well, I got the scholarship, and that kind of started my journey there. So um, I'm a I'm a proud member of the Sherm Foundation leadership circle and continue to support the organization that way. I also, though, enjoy teaching and, and getting in front of young HR professionals or young HR students and just being able to share stories with them. And I, my time in Bloomington, I was able to do that a lot at Indiana University. At least, every, I mean, every semester I was in several classes as a guest lecturer. And one of my, um, one of my friends who is a professor at the School of Public and Environmental Affairs at IU she would invite me in every semester to her nonprofit HR management class, and this was a grad level class. And it, she got to the point and said, "Okay, you've learned all the theory stuff from me. Now, Mr. Galen here is going to tell you how the theory does not apply in the real world." And she'd just sit back and and cherish that because I think the first time I said half the stuff you're learning in class will not work for you in the field. Um, huh. She was shocked by that at first, but she came to relish it and, and integrate it into her curriculum as we went on. And we're, we remain good friends to this day. And in fact, I may even see, see her when I have a chance to go down to Bloomington uh, this upcoming weekend. Nice. Nice. Brad, do you have a favorite movie? I do. My favorite movie is Lawrence of Arabia, actually. That's a good one. How about a favorite musician or band? Favorite musician or band? That's that's more difficult. Um, that's going to depend on my mood of what I'm listening to. I listen to music that runs the gamut as, as a former band band person. And I know, John, you and I have talked about that. Uh, we, we've shared that passion for many years. Uh, right now, I would probably say Queen. And I'm loving the fact that my 14-year-old daughter is hooked on Queen to the point that she's seen the movie Bohemian Rhapsody four times, only once with us. Um, 
but that's probably the music that I've been listening to most lately. How about a favorite TV show? I don't watch a whole lot of TV, but one episode that is on my constant DVR that I record every week that it's new, both, well, actually two of them, Chicago Fire and Chicago PD. Um, those are probably the two that I go to most, and those are probably the only two that I watch on a regular basis, other than college basketball and the occasional football game. Well, Brad, like you mentioned, we we certainly have a shared passion for instrumental music, and when we talked last year, some of the connections that you had, particularly with uh, Bill Cook. For those of you who don't know, Bill Cook was uh, quite a quite a businessman and was also very instrumental in a, a drum and bugle corps that has been gone for many, many years. But it was amazing when you were telling the story about knowing Mr. Cook and, again, just changing on a personal level for me. So that was that was astounding, <laughs> I have to tell you, and you blew me away when you told me that story. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's really neat. Just I mean, he was an amazing person and and transformed Bloomington um, single handedly and think, got behind things like Star of Indiana and and but even I mean, he was the red before his death. He was the richest person in the state of Indiana. Yet he would go still at the office every day at at his company. And my wife's office was just down from his. And um, my wife got. I don't know if I told you this story, but my wife got hurt at work. She had hurt her ankle. She slipped in the parking lot on an icy day. And and so she was on crutches for a little bit and uh, trying to get into the office one day. And there he is, and he's holding the door for her. So, And there aren't many billionaires around who would have been standing there holding the door for a low-level employee on crutches. And But that's just who he was. And it, it was a real family organization through and through. And, um, I mean, to the point that he would drive the tour bus for the drum corps. You know, here he was, and no, no no pretense about him, just a really class act. If you're not listening to Lawrence of, or watching Lawrence of Arabia, rather, or listening to Queen or watching the Chicago shows, what else do you like to do outside of work, Brad? Uh, what else do I do outside of work? Well, a lot of my time is, is centered around my kids. And um, at this point, my my son has moved away. He's now at my alma mater down in Indiana. Um, I'm hoping he's at a basketball game right now because I use playing Iowa down in Bloomington. Um, so I'll be cheering against uh, Mr. Dorgensen's team tonight. <laughs> but they they but my kids still occupy a lot of my time. I feel like right now my daughter, who's 14, she's a freshman in high school, and involved in lots of stuff. I feel like I'm her show for a lot of the time. So right now we're in the midst of Winter Guard, which is something she's been gotten involved with this year. We have conditioning starting up for lacrosse. Uh, she's an avid French horn player. So we have lessons and different things like that. And as we get into the spring, lacrosse season will kick off. So I will be spending lots of time, some of it freezing and some of it probably baking because that's the weather here in Michigan at times. Um, as she plays goalie on the lacrosse pitch and, and has fun there her first season in high school. So that's really the center of my, my outside stuff. Um, I do enjoy food and sometimes a little too much. I actually, I go to the doctor for my annual physical in about a month and I'm trying to decide is it too late to try to start eating better before I have to get my blood draws and stuff, but <laughs> probably is. So, um, but yeah, and and you know my my wife and I we 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 enjoy each other's company and I'm very lucky of 21 coming up on 22 years now of marriage and we get a chance to travel together and those kind of things we like to take advantage of that. We both enjoy just exploring new things, which has been fun here in Michigan getting to explore this uh, magnificent nature that we have in this state. But usually when the weather is better than it is now, so kind of hunker down and wait for winter to end, and then we go enjoy the big lake and all of those things. Finally, Brad, if you weren't in the HR profession, what do you think you'd be doing? I think one of my other one of geeky things that I like doing is looking at weather forecasts and things like that. I would have loved to have been a storm chaser and be out in the plains chasing tornadoes or experiencing hurricanes firsthand. So. Um, and I didn't figure out until my, my last semester at IU, had I added one more or two more classes in geography, I could have had a minor in geography. And there were just some additional weather classes I could have taken and done that. So 
I think that's what I'd be doing. We haven't invented like um, light speed space travel yet, and I can't be a starship captain. I, I'm probably a weather person <laughs> chasing storm. So. I, Brad, starship I can captain. safely say you are the you are the first person to say storm chaser or starship captain. Either one. Kudos to you, sir. Hey, you know, get have a diverse life. You gotta gotta live it up. <laughs> Maybe it's the it. Scotch talking. I don't know. <laughs> well, we, Brad, we will certainly say we're glad you're not out chasing storms or any type of uh, inclement weather. Because if you were, we probably wouldn't be talking to you tonight. And we're really glad that we are. Some of our listeners that may not know you, I know they're going to want to get in touch or, or be following you now that they've heard. What's the best way for them to find you out there? Um, I'm very active on Twitter, and my Twitter handle is at Brad Galen, just B-R-A-D-G-A-L-I-N. I can also be found on Facebook. I will accept a random friend request if you, as long as you tell me who you are and why you know me. And uh, LinkedIn, obviously, my profile's out there under Bradley Galen. Um, and my websites, I have two. I have my rollercoasterhr.com, which is my blog. And also AllegroHR.com, which is uh, the side gig where I do consulting. And I think there's some not-so-fabulous pictures of me on that site. So um, that, that that's always fun for some uh, some entertainment. We will be sure to have all that in the show notes. No pictures, just links. <laughs> Wendy, what's the best way for our listeners to find you? Best way to find me is on my blog, MyDailyJourney.com. Daily is D as in dog, A-I-L-E-Y. And of course, the fourth Sunday of each month, you will find me on Twitter at 7 p.m. Eastern time for our monthly HR Social Hour Twitter chat. How about you, John? Easiest way to find me, hrsocialhourpodcast.podbean.com. If you go to the left-hand top side of the screen, you'll see some little lines. You click there, it'll drop down and show you all my social accounts. While you're there, check out the show. Make sure you rate and review. Haven't asked for a while, but... If you do listen on iTunes and any other platforms, if you can just give us five stars and, and, a, and a review, we really do appreciate it because, again, all those ratings and reviews help boost the signal and boost us in the charts. So, Brad, again, thanks for being with us tonight. And so for the HR Social Hour Half Hour Podcast, I'm John. And I'm Wendy. And as always, be sure to connect. Give back. And network. network. Take care, everyone. We'll see you soon. <laughs>